you know, what's going to cause that company to be transferable, sustainable? You've got to reduce the dependency on the sellers. And that's not so easy to do either. Because solving the new business equation is very hard. A high percentage of your listeners have tried to hire a salesperson and it hasn't worked. And, you know, you've got to address the new business process and, and performance. Welcome to the Agency Profit Podcast, a show dedicated to going deep space on agency operations, which is just as nerdy as it sounds. I'm your host, Marcel Petipoff. I'm the CEO of Parakeeto, a firm that helps digital and creative agencies measure and improve their profitability. Join me as I interview some of the smartest thought leaders and agency owners in our space and go deep into operations and metrics and all the other things you need to get right so you can spend less time worrying about operations and more time I'm executing on your vision. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Agency Profit Podcast. I am thrilled today to be joined by an extremely experienced, not only entrepreneur, but also mergers and acquisitions, advisor, broker, savant of sorts, David Tobin, uh, who I have the pleasure of connecting with through Roy Page, uh, another advisor at the firm that uh, I've known for some time that we've collaborated on our clients with. And he's here today to talk to us about the current context as it relates to M&A and really what you need to know to have a great exit in your firm. So with all of that, David, thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. Marcel, thank you for having me. With that introduction, you put a lot of pressure on me. I better <laughs> pretend that I know what I'm speaking about. Well, I don't think there's much pretending that you have to do, David. Uh, you've started and sold more businesses than most people will run in their lifetime. Uh, and now you help other people get to that that big important moment in their career of an exit. So I'd love to start with a little bit of your background. How did you get into entrepreneurship? What are some of the businesses that you ran before deciding to start Tobin Left? Uh, thank you for the ability to share a little bit about my background. I actually started my first business in school. I grew up in an advertising family, started publishing coupon books and selling advertising in college. What contributed to what I'm doing today, my, my last agency, our niche or specialty was working with financial services companies and agencies. They had an interest to put their advisors in front of business owners. We felt that the best hook or door opener would be to position our clients' advisors as specialists in exit planning, succession planning. And it worked. The, uh, your listeners, many of whom are business owners, certainly appreciate those are topics that are on the minds of owners. So I, I sold that business in 2004. I was away from the industry for a few years. I, I would meet a business owner. I couldn't help myself or sell. I would say to them, what is your exit plan? And that's what they wanted to talk about. So we, I started to do consulting around exit planning 15 years ago. And from there, it expanded to where we started to help agency owners sell their companies. So we started to provide M&A advisory services. And I'm thankful today. I've got seven partners at Tobin Left. I'll give a real quick plug. We're mission driven to help our clients to maximize and monetize their life's work. We keep it in perspective. People of other callings in life. We're just talking about their business life's work. So I'm thrilled to be here with you. Well, and I, what I love about your firm is that several of you on that team of partners have run and exited professional services firms, Roy being one of those people that built, yes. sold a firm through you with your advice and then decided to join the firm and help other people do the same. So there's a lot of practical experience there. The other thing that I like about your firm is that um, you have this consulting advisory service that is independent from actually having to transact at any given moment. And so I think that just yes. really creates this very easy way to have a, a founder or a firm owner come in and get the advice that they need when they need it, start the process really early without, you know, this big involved commitment or a lot of strings attached, uh, which I think is a, a smart move and, and makes it really easy to frankly recommend people talk to you, which I do pretty often. <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it has served us and our clients well, not to just approach it that every solution is to sell to a strategic buyer or a private equity group, but to truly help owners appreciate 
what are the viable exit pathways, the yeah. economics, the pros and cons? Well, let's start there, because I think that that's a place that not a lot of people have put a lot of thought into, which is, you know, what are the different vehicles for an exit or some of the different ways that people exit their businesses and some of the ways of thinking about those options and what is most likely for you in your situation if you're running a firm today and thinking about that exit plan? Sure. Well, certainly all your listeners know that the ones that come to light right away would be to sell to another agency or a consulting firm or a technology company that plays in the agency space. When you go beyond that, a lot depends on the size of the company in terms of the selling price or the enterprise value. Companies, agencies that are valued less than, for example, $5 million, there's a real market of entrepreneurs and individuals that would love to buy a quality company. And they most likely can line up financing through a bank backed by the Small Business Administration. So at a certain size, let's not rule out entrepreneurs that are looking for viable companies. The smaller agencies typically valued 5 million or less, or even as high as eight or 9 million management buyout plans, looking at financing arrangements or strategies to be able to help key employees to acquire the business over time is also something that many of our clients will assess the viability and the economics of an internal transaction compared to selling outside. So on the one end of the spectrum, you have strategic buyers, individuals, employees. When agencies have reached a certain size and or they have a strong vision for growth, then they may attract the interest of financial sponsors. And under the financial sponsor umbrella would include private equity groups, family offices, venture capitalists that are looking for an opportunity to instill their capital and resources to grow something and make it bigger. And in between, we've got a couple situations where is it viable to sell to a client? Merging. We've helped clients form ESOPs. We're not ESOP specialists, but we have strategic alliances with specialists in that area. So it, it's just an example of there is a spectrum. And the more business owners learn, I mean, it can only serve us all well. Yeah. Um, so just in summary, there's, there's kind of the entrepreneurial buyer. It's outside of strategic selling to another agency, selling to, you know, a tech company, someone that is buying your business for a strategic reason based on some kind of investment thesis or roll up strategy or whatever the case might be a cross selling opportunity. There's other entrepreneurs that are looking to buy businesses and you no, know, my, my wife would be an example of one of those. She went out and bought a business this year because that's what she wanted to do to, uh, as her next job. There's management buyout plans. There's ESOPs, which not a lot of people talk about, but um, are a really interesting option because they're pretty, I mean, I don't want to call it a guaranteed exit, but it is a very straightforward path to getting, you know, air quotes, fair market value for your business, uh, assuming that the financing and stuff can all happen. So I think that's a really interesting one that not a lot of people are looking at, but it I'm hearing a lot more about these days. And then you have for larger businesses, the financial sponsors. So, um, you know, capital from private equity, family office, VC, et cetera, uh, and the merging option as well. So lots of different options. How does a firm owner think through, you know, which options might be most applicable to them? And how do you recommend they start thinking about this and planning for, you know, what they might want to do when the time comes for them to exit the business? Well, certainly, when your listeners bring on a new client, they start with trying to understand the needs, vision, desires of their client. I mean, exit planning, it's very similar. I mean, it's, it's a given. Almost everybody is looking to maximize the economics, the purchase price. Everybody prefers to get as much cash at closing. When you go beyond that, I mean, it's a, about the culture and will it be the right fit for employees? Will they be able to serve clients? 
And also in many situations, because your listeners own service firms, most of them, the likely deal structure is going to include some percentage of the purchase price tied to future performance. You'll hear the term earn out provisions where you've got to deliver at a certain level of billings or net income for a few years. Well, then you get into who do I want to work with? Do I want partners? Now, if you're going to go to a financial sponsor, you're most likely going to maintain equity. So the non-financial elements do become important. I mean, you've got to hopefully like and respect the people with whom you're going to sell to. And when we, if we get into the part about the process of selling, we believe a very important step is to take the needed time to get to know the prospective buyers, not just looking at their letters of intent or IOI, but really spend time with them on shared vision, values. I mean, those sound basic, but let's not lose sight of how important it is. You've raised something here that I think is really important, which is the understanding that in my experience, it's extremely uncommon when selling a professional services firm to get, you know, what I would call a beach deal where you get a big check for the value of your company at closing, no strings attached, and you can go post up on the beach and never think about it again, because there is very little, um, you know, very little on the balance sheet, essentially, for a services firm, there's often going to have to be a lot of structure to help de-risk what is inherently a fairly high risk business. And as a result of that, you know, there's lots of things that we could talk about in planning for the exit that will help reduce that risk. But even still, the chances that you're going to have to stick around, be a part of a transition for a period of time, have some amount of that value roll into the next firm or be tied to performance or so on is very, very high. And I think this is a really important consideration because a lot of people view an exit as a finish line. In a lot of cases, it's a starting line for a whole new chapter in their career. And that's a really important thing to consider on routes to that exit. And, and when you start building that timeline and working backwards in terms of what you need to do. Yeah, it's a good point on the timeline and working backwards. We tell most prospective clients to allow a three to four year runway. The runway being on average, at least with our firm, it takes nine months to get a company sold. From the time you make a commitment and you plan it until the wire transfer on average. Some deals less time, some more. Post-closing, in most situations, a portion of the purchase price will be contingent over a two to three year period. Now, it doesn't mean the seller has to work full time for the two to three year period, but he or she has to stand behind the financial performance of the company they delivered. So if you, I mean, if it's two to three years on an earn out, six, nine, possibly 12 months to get a company sold, that's where you have that three to four year runway. And then what happens if, and it relates to deal terms, if an owner is going to have to work with the seller, or the seller is going to have to work with the buyer for some number of years, any deal that they are going to consider, they're going to naturally say, I'm going to compare the economics to if I just keep the company. And if the economics aren't strong enough, they won't do the deal because then they'll say, I'll be better off just holding the company. I still own it at the end of the three year period. Now, that's a vicious cycle that we're selling because at some point your owners want to get off this you know, treadmill that they have to run pretty fast on. So, but, but that's, that's the balancing when you have to take into account the time period. Back to your point, they're not, let's do a transaction and go to the beach type structures. And then with the financial sponsors that we spoke about, it's most likely a longer runway because the appeal of private equity group or family office, it's that overuse saying of two bites at the apple. The first liquidity event is cash and stock in a platform, all leading up to sell that platform when it's more valuable in typically five years.
Do you want some free resources to help you measure and improve your profitability? If you do, then I want to tell you about our agency profitability toolkit, which you can grab absolutely free in the show notes or by heading to parakeeto.com forward slash toolkit. It's packed with training videos, cheat sheets, templates, and all kinds of other great resources to help you start measuring and improving the essential metrics that are going to drive better profitability in your business. And it's helped thousands of other agencies around the world do the same. So I want to encourage you to go and grab a copy of that. And if you'd rather get in the fast lane and just have our team of experts guide you through the process of measuring and improving your profitability, then I want to encourage you to apply for a consultation at parakeeto.com. And with that, I want to thank you again for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the episode and I'll let you get back to it. Yeah. And just to kind of put that into layman's terms for those listening, there's this very common structure in private equity of, of what we call rolled equity, right? So you know, you come to me, you say, hey, I'm going to pay you a million dollars for your business. I'll give you $500,000 in cash up front. The other 500,000 we're going to roll and you'll get stock in this private equity firm. And this is our thesis. We're going to buy a hundred agencies over seven years. Uh, the, you know, the, we're going to buy them at a three X EBITDA. We're going to sell them at a nine X once we've rolled them all up and integrated them. And so you'll get this, this kind of big earnout. but you know, you don't really have control over the liquidity of that. It's it's hard to liquidate it on a secondary market. A lot of times it's not even possible based on the deal terms. And so you really have to believe, I think, in the thesis of the private equity acquirer if you are relying on the liquidity from that additional stock for the lifestyle that you want to then live after the exit. So I think that's a really important thing to, to call out. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, exactly. You sound like an M&A guy, not an agency <laughs> owner. <laughs> I know. You, honestly, I think uh, my dream after this is to do some form of private equity. It, it's such a stimulating intersection of like finance and entrepreneurship. It's it's both of those worlds coming together. So I'm just a nerd when it comes to this stuff, and that's why mm -hmm. I I tend to have a <laughs> I like to have people who talk M and A on the show. Now, with that, I want to take a bit of a hard transition before we talk about the planning process, which I do want to spend some time on, but. We're at a bit of a weird time right now. So it's July 16th, 2024, as we're recording this. The economy is kind of weird right now. Like, are we going into recession? Are we not? Have we already had a recession? Uh, it's been a really interesting couple of years. And of course, interest rates are extremely high right now. It's looking like they might come down. But, you know, this context is a little bit strange. And I'm really curious, because you see so much deal flow how are you seeing this impact M&A activity in specifically the professional services space? There's a tale of two types of sellers and opportunities. What you touched on with market conditions, where it has impacted a percentage of our clients, it's not because of the interest rates being high for the buyer to secure the financing. The environment has caused operating companies to be performing lower or poorer to where they have previously. And then sellers, because you only get to sell your company one time, will wait or pull back because it's going to be reflected to an extent when I mean, the deal terms will be impacted if they're trending down. So the economic conditions, it's been more at the individual company level. And the reason I say it's a tale of two opportunities, the flip side is we are seeing more interest from prospective buyers probably than we ever have. And I've had the firm now for 15 years. You, since you love to talk M&A, you'll hear terms like there's a lot of dry power on the sidelines, meaning capital to deploy. Private equity groups have moved aggressively into the Marcom space, which has benefited many of our clients. So there's endless sources of capital for quality companies. Quality meaning they have a thesis, their margins are maintained, they're growing. They're, we're getting deals done in that situation. In turn, it's a real struggle with somebody's earnings and top line have been flat or going down. It makes perfect sense because, you know, you have this compounding effect, right, in terms of equity value where, you know, you've had a great three-year run of growth, of consistent EBITDA, that EBITDA is going up, your equity value is going up, and then you have, you know, maybe 2023, which a lot of people listening, you might 
know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden you're flat. Maybe you're down 10% over last year because you waited a little too long to let some staff go and cut overhead costs. Your EBITDA was kind of crappy, but it's not just the, let's call it $300,000 that you lost on an EBITDA that you're feeling now in the context of a sale. It's five times that amount in equity value that has now been written off because of this new context of the deal. So it makes sense that a buyer, because of that loss aversion, all of a sudden they're thinking, oh, time to reset this timeline or let's let's push this back another two years to see if we can get back to where we were and exit for the value that we want to have in the business. Um, so that, that's making a lot of sense. Now, with all that said, you mentioned the other side of that equation, which is a good quality company right now is very desirable. And it's interesting because we saw this in tech as well, where you know we've had two decades of ZERP investing from venture capital. And now all of a sudden, venture capitalists are talking about things that they didn't really care a whole lot about in the tech space now, like margins and unit economics. <laughs> and like, when are we going to have a business model that actually works here? All of a sudden, people care about this. Um, and I think that does speak to the opportunity. So with that in mind, we could talk about exit planning. What are some of those key things that you know, a firm can be doing leading up to their, the exit to make sure that they protect and grow their equity value as much as possible. So when you and I were just prepping, we'll call it for, for this, you had said, let's try to go beyond the basics. I mean, every owner knows you want to be growing. Your margins are important. Net income or EBITDA is a percentage of your fee income. Those are, those are table stakes. The, I put it high on the list, the vision for growth. Now that may also sound obvious, but I just want to put it back on the table that sure historic growth is good, but to really have a vision on how with either somebody else's resources or capital, this can become a much more valuable opportunity. We were talking about financial sponsors and the two bites at the apple. For most financial sponsors, they're assessing an opportunity to say, if I paid X today, how could it be worth three times that amount in five years? And they get there through, through the arbitrage on a multiple combined with growth of earnings combined with having even a stronger story to tell the buyer in the future. So a real vision for, for enhanced value. That doesn't always just mean more sales. You know, a quick example where we have a client now, their value proposition is around their media arm and capturing margin on programmatic media, just as an example, where they can quantify for every dollar of media they're going to pick up X of margin. We have other clients that they've demonstrated they have a th true three pronged sales strategy of acquisitions, organic growth, and new business. And they've quantified each one. They've demonstrated that they can make and integrate smaller tuck in acquisitions. They can show a vision for growth. There's a lot of ways to get there, not just by being a specialist in a certain sector. So I really highlight that vision for growth. Any buyer wants confidence that this company is going to be transferable, sustainable. Well, on the confidence, the way to instill confidence, institute phantom stock plans, incentives for the key employees, to be financially rewarded, to stay with the buyer. I mean, everybody knows the importance of client concentration risk. That's not so easy to solve. The systems, processes for new business opportunities. I mean, I keep hearing that same thing. We're going to talk to agency owners. We're the shoemaker's children. They're not doing the marketing for, for their own agencies. So it's, you know, what's going to cause that company to be transferable, sustainable? You've got to reduce the dependency on the sellers. And that's not so easy to do either. Because solving the new business equation is very hard. A high percentage of your listeners have tried to hire a salesperson and it hasn't worked. And, you know, you've got to address the new business process and performance.
So a lot of this really comes back to de-risking the revenue and the cash flow that the seller is purchasing through all these different vectors. So reducing reliance on the owners, obviously having you know legal finance all buttoned up, processes, et cetera. Um, I do like this idea of also being able to clearly articulate a thesis for how it's going to continue to grow, right? So what that future trajectory looks like. One of the things that I, I don't think enough people are thinking about is, okay, great. Let's say my plan is to exit in three years. Now I have this laundry list of things that I need to do. And a lot of them are either going to take a lot of time, or if I want to bring in an expert or a consultant or you know make investments, they're going to cost money. And then the worry becomes, oh, well, you know, if my EBITDA is the thing that I'm being scrutinized on, then I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. But I think what a lot of people fail to consider is the difference between what is going to be viewed as an operating expenses when adjustments to EBIT are being made and these things that are more discretionary one-time investments. And I think if you have a plan around this stuff, it completely changes the mental math that you make around a decision like, should I bring in a consultant, for example, to you know, clean up all of our client contracts so that that's not a liability risk that comes up in due diligence? And it's a one-time investment that we can then add back to EBITDA and not have necessarily affect our equity value. So you start to think about, okay, it's a dollar in, but I get you know $10 back in terms of enterprise value. So what's your framework for thinking through the, the kind of investments in the business that should be happening leading up to that exit timeline? Well, you touched on a very important point, which is to document, quantify investments like that. Not every buyer will accept all the ad backs that you or your advisory team put forth, but you really want to, any of those one-off investments, whether they're research and development, prepping for a liquidity event, document them, show it, present it. That's all an important part of it. Now, some percentage people are gonna realize that's ongoing expenses. The and, and this is where, you know, a constant focus on what's important to the owner the, they don't have to be mutually exclusive making investments that will help for to get a higher purchase price. Sometimes there, there is a trade-off. It's you know, like, for example, on the new business side, to solve that, if you're going to invest in a person or people, I mean, it gets into six figures before someone is going to be productive and profitable. And that's a tough decision to make. If most of the sales are dependent on the founder or the seller. That's not going to be a sellable company without that person. So it, it really is a balance between what can I take out today compared to will that be offset through a future exit? And it's hard because you're not guaranteed that there's going to be an exit waiting for you on I don't know if I'm helping your listeners. All I'm doing is reinforcing that it takes a lot of time and energy to address those questions. And it's nuanced, but I think it also speaks to the value of having someone you can talk to about this stuff and you know get a second opinion on some of these big decisions and investments that's able to help you contextualize that within what the objective actually is. And that's, you know, we, we just did a podcast episode with, my good friend Ryan Tansom, who uh, you know has this great framework for thinking about how to operate the business, working backwards from the purpose that that asset serves in terms of setting this person up for a lifestyle. And it, you know, you sound like you have a very similar approach. Where the first thing is like, what what are we actually optimizing for here? What's the life that you want to live? And then let's work backwards to how this asset can help support getting you to that place. And you know, who might we sell to? When might we do that? What's the timeline? And then it becomes a little easier to answer some of these questions and make the air quotes right decision or understand what kind of trade-offs do or don't make sense. Yeah. And I don't want to lose sight of something you just said that's very important. Who you might sell to, if you have time, meaning you're thinking about selling in a couple of years, many transactions certainly are sold to buyers that the seller knows or has a relationship or they did projects together. Get to know prospective buyers. Make a conscious effort. The same way some of your listeners, I mean, they do account-based marketing, database marketing, 
content management relate. And these are strategies they're employing with many of their clients. Put together a list of prospective partners or buyers that you like, you respect, and make a conscious effort to keep your name in front of them. Make sure they're on your content distribution list. Make a point to see them at industry trade shows. That could truly pay off because many of our deals, we help when our clients know a prospective buyer and we help pull that together. That, and then certainly we're out there trying to market to a larger audience for, for other clients. It's a good point. A lot of that stuff does come from the network and, you know, you mentioned management buyout plans or entrepreneurial, you know, buyouts or mergers. A lot of that stuff tends to be relationship based. There's one other side of this that I think I'd like to talk about. Um, and we might be getting into the kind of thing that you pull other folks into, but with your experience, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this, which is taxes. Um, I think it's very easy to get lured into focusing on the number that you sell for that's going to look really nice in a press release uh, or something like that. But we've already talked about structure, right? So there's a whole other side of that equation, which is how much of that is cash, how much of that is rolled, what is actually the risk profile of that? Because it's not always that the highest number is going to get you the most money as a founder. And then the other side of the equation is the government's going to want their cut. And there are you know, different ways of setting up structure to defer or mitigate some of that. What is your advice? I mean, I, tax is one component, but what is your advice for founders on how to start thinking about ways to maximize what they're actually able to take home from a transaction, considering things like taxes and, and that kind of stuff? To answer your questions on ways they can take home more, I'll address it for taxes. And there's a couple key other key elements that help on, on the take home. In most situations, decisions around an exit, it's not driven by tax planning. It's a given you're gonna have good tax advisors because there's gonna be a large capital um, in infusion. The deals are gonna be structured on a tax favored basis to receive capital gains, even the deferred payments it's not going to be paid as ordinary income. So in the States, you're able to realize capital gains, tax treatment. The fact that it's a service, people are selling service firms, even if it's an asset sale compared to a stock sale, the difference between those two structures is minimal as it relates to tax planning. So yes, you want a good tax advisor, most of the dollars paid will be taxed favorably. The part though, where you can do some planning back to the point where you said on take home, an area that is one that there's gonna be a lot of attention focused on is working capital. Many people have not gone through the selling process are upset when they learn that not every dollar on their balance sheet they get to keep. Many sellers think, that's my money. The accounts receivable and cash and so forth. In most situations, if there's a buyer, if they're experienced or sophisticated, if they're gonna pay you five, six, seven times earnings, they're gonna expect the seller to deliver a company that has, quote, adequate working cap. And there's a lot that goes into that. And you can do things to make the calculation more favorable, i.e., if your receivables on average are lower, you collect your money quicker, then the requirement that you have to deliver is lower. So having a really efficient way of collecting your receivables will benefit you when it's time to sell. I mean, that, that's just an example. So I encourage your listeners to really appreciate what goes into working capital calculations and managing the balance sheet towards that. Because that, those are hard dollars that, that come into play. 
Yeah, that can be get pretty material from what we've seen, uh, especially if there's, you know, large installments being paid up front or at completion of projects, there can be a lot of money tied up uh, just in receivables alone. Yes. I mean, because most of these transactions, you know, they'll say cash free, debt free transaction, but that you still have to deliver a level of working capital, which is receivables and, and other assets. Uh, but but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't let taxes at all drive or wag the tail. It's you'll have good tax planning. It's going to be done in an efficient way. I bring them back to focusing on what's really important, which is the value proposition, the profitability, the dependency around the seller. Well, David, I would love to chat more. I could talk about this all day. Maybe that makes me weird. But it's what I love to talk about. And I really thank you for making some time to be here with us today. I'm sure there's some people that are listening that would love to learn more about you and what you're doing at Tobin Less. So where should we send them in the show notes uh, so they can get more information about you? Well, I appreciate that. I mean, certainly on our website, there's the contact page, Tobin Left, T-O-B-I-N-L-E-F-F.com. I'd mentioned, you know, there's seven partners. Any one of us would welcome to have discussions with owners and just talk about their business in the M and A market, and we're, we're happy to do that. I appreciate you having me on to to share uh, part of our journey. Excellent. And with that, if you're listening, we'll leave a link to Tobin Left's website, to uh, David's LinkedIn page. We'll also leave some information on Roy, who's one of the partners there that you know I've had a good relationship with. And uh, with all of that, David, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Marcel. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you've ever found yourself thinking, man, I get so much value from this podcast. I wish there was something I could do to return the favor. Well, today's your lucky day because you can leave us a review wherever you're listening to this. And it is incredibly helpful. Of course, if you haven't grabbed a free copy of the Agency Profit Toolkit, go and get that. It's got tons of free resources to help you improve your profitability. If you're looking to get in the fast lane and get help from experts to improve your profitability and measure your most important metrics, then apply for a consultation at parakeeto.com. We'd love to chat with you and figure out how we can help. With all of that, thank you so much for being a listener and we will see you on the next episode.